بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليه محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته ان شاء الله تعالى I'm going to speak tonight about the Quran the greatness of the Quran the uniqueness uh, of the Quran so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that in the month of Ramadan, Shah Ramadan, الذي أنزل فيه القرآن, that it was in the month of Ramadan in which uh, the Quran was revealed to humanity. <clears throat> so this is a blessed month. It's blessed for a number of reasons. First and foremost, because it is it, it marks the commencement of the Quranic revelation uh, to the world. Uh, the the bi'atha of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Um, uh, the beginning of the revelation that came to him. So um, I'm going to talk about the Quran, and I'm going to talk a little bit, maybe a little bit more academically uh, than than what usually probably happens on a night like this, where it's more sort of a a preaching style or khutbah style. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is because there are a lot of questions about uh, the Quran lately. Of course, there are a lot of um, you know anti-Muslim um, you know people on the internet, whether they're atheists or Christian, who are making a lot of claims about the Quran, who are criticizing the Quran in the, in a polemical sort of sense. Uh, so I thought I'd address some of these issues, or at least talk about the Quran um, from the standpoint of uh, the the classical scholarship. So I've chosen to talk about the uniqueness of the Quran. Right, so the Quran itself issues a challenge. Okay, this is called a tahaddi. Okay, and um, the most recent challenge is in Al-Baqarah, verse twenty-three. Okay, if you are, are if you happen to be in doubt about what we have revealed um, to our servant. Uh, then bring a surah like unto it, a chapter like unto it, and call to your aid uh, any whom you want um, as 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 helpers, other than Allah. If you speak the truth, truth. In lam tafalu wa lam tafalu, right? And if you can't do it and you won't do it, fataqul nar alati wakuduha nasu al hijara. Then fear the fire whose fuel is men and stones, or adat lil kafirin. Prepared for those who reject faith. So Imam Az-Zarqashi, he said that initially the challenge was to produce ten uh, was was to produce a recital an, an account like this Quran, right? فَلْيَأْتُوا بِحَدِيثِ مِثْلِهِ Produce something like the whole of the Quran. Then it was reduced to ten suwar. فَأْتُوا بِعَشْرِ سُوَرٍ مِثْلِهِ Finally, it was reduced to one surah. فَأَتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِنْ مِثْلِهِ That's the last challenge being issued uh, in, in Medina. So the challenge of the Qur'an testifies to its i'jaz, what's known as i'jaz al-Qur'an, which is sometimes translated as the, the insuperability of the Qur'an, the inimitability of the Qur'an. So the, the proposition that the Qur'an cannot be uh, imitated. Of course, the word i'jaz is a form for infinitive in grammar, meaning to debilitate, to disable, uh, or to incapacitate. So this is this is the concept. The word mu'jiza is the active participle. Um, in theology, it's a technical term for a prophetic miracle. A mu'jiza is a prophetic miracle, as opposed to a karama, which is a saintly miracle, non-prophetic miracle. Linguistically, Mu'jiza is that which incapacitates. Okay, so the Quran is a mu'jiza in the sense that it incapacitates others from producing its likeness. Now, the first theologians to broach uh, the subject of the nature of the Quran's i'jaz were probably uh, Mu'tazili theologians, uh, Mu'tazilite. We call them Mu'tazili theologians. So Ibrahim and Nadam, for example, from Basra in Iraq. So his position, and this is the standard Mu'tazili position, is that he says, if all the Arabs were left alone, they would have been able to compose pieces like those of the Quran, 
the aql, in other words, would have been able to do it. So the Martazilite, they give the intellect a status that, that it doesn't, it doesn't uh, deserve. And their position really is that the Qur'an, this is the Murtazilite position, is that the Qur'an is really more like ipsissima vox, is more like the very voice of God. In other words, more like, more like an inspired text rather than a revealed text. So it's kind of like what Christians believe about the Bible as opposed to like what Jews believe about uh, the Torah. Right? It's not the revealed words of God. In other words, God is not choosing the exact words but rather inspiring a prophet to choose his own words, but the meanings are, are given to that prophet. So that's, that's more akin to the Mu'tazili position. So he says, if all the Arabs were left alone, they would have been able to compose pieces. So left alone are the operative words here. So the Mu'tazili position is that the Quran's jazz is external to its text, right? Rather than internal, it's extrinsic rather than intrinsic. In other words, it is possible for the Arab poets to produce the likes of the Quran to match its unique style, to rival its eloquence, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simply will not allow them to do that. Right? He will deflect them from that. Yasrifuhum anhu. Right? So they call it a sarfa. The sarfa is the deflection or the aversion. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to incapacitate anyone who tries to imitate, to imitate uh, the Qur'an from, uh, from producing its likeness by deflecting them. So the analogy is like, imagine there's, a, um, there's an expert marksman, right? A, a, an expert um, uh, archer. And uh, there's a target that's five feet away from him, just five feet away. And uh, so he aims at the target, he aims at the, the target and he misses completely. And he tries it again, over and over and over again, and he can't seem to hit the target. He's an expert marksman. It's five feet away and he's, he does it a hundred times and he's zero for a hundred. So then his only conclusion must be that something is, um, something is causing me not to do this. Or something is preventing me from hitting the target. Right? Prevention must be external. Now, the Sunni position is that the ijaz is internal, okay? that, it's, that it's intrinsic to the text. In other words, it is impossible for the Arab poets to produce the likes uh, of the Quran. So going back to this uh, archery analogy, imagine now this, this expert marksman, he's trying to hit a target that's 500 yards away. So he tries over and over and over again, and he, he can't even get close to it because it's just impossible. He doesn't have the capacity to do something like that. So in this case, prevention is internal. Another analogy is like, imagine there's like a room and there's something, there's a book in this room, let's say it's called the book of secrets or something. It's on a table and you want to get to this book and read it. So you go inside the room and you notice that there are guards there right, that are preventing you from even touching the book. So you are being externally incapacitated. That's akin to the Mu'tazili position. But now let's say another scenario, you go into the room and the book is there. So you pick it up and you open it and you notice that it's written in a strange code that you don't understand. So you don't understand, so you can't understand it, right? So now you're being internally incapacitated and that's akin to the the Sunni position, the nature of the book itself incapacitates you. So the problem with the Mu'tazili position is that it does not locate the miracle of the Qur'an within the Qur'an, but rather outside of the Qur'an. Okay, or to put it another way, the Mu'tazilite position is like, it is as if the prophet can move his foot like normal, but everyone else is somehow paralyzed, which is abnormal. And that is the very de definition of a miracle. Right, kharq al-adat, which is a, a break or breach of what is customary, a breach of what is normal. The Sunni position is as if the prophet can walk on water, which is abnormal, while everyone else can't, which is normal. So at the end of the day, both are saying the same thing. Imitation of the Quran will not be done. Okay, so let's unpack this concept of, of i'jaz a bit further. According to some Sunni ulama, the i'jaz of the Qur'an is detected through intuition, okay? Uh, in other words, its impact upon the listener. 
the way that the Quran causes joy and tears and fear and hope, for example. Others say no, because this is subjective, right? It's like, whose poetry is more beautiful? Whose poetry is more impactful, Shakespeare or Wordsworth? Some people will say Shakespeare, some people might say Wordsworth. Well, how do you know who's right, right? Some would say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, if you, you know, most people find that their own children are the most beautiful children. That's probably because emotion gets involved or they see themselves in their children. So we need objective standards of beauty, okay? Others would argue that in poetry, there is an objective standard, that Shakespeare is objectively more beautiful, more eloquent than all of the other poets. Okay, this is why he became the most beloved of all the English poets and why most experts say that his poetry is superior. Therefore, we also have objective standards when it comes to physical human beauty. And this might not be PC, but that's okay. It's, it's true. This is, you know, this is, what, this is what, for example, the, the, the nursery rhyme, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, uh, that's what it's trying to teach children, that, that there's, a, there's a standard for beauty. Um, so if, if, you, if you look at the Prophet Wasallam, for example, who is the epitome of physical beauty, right? He was of medium height, right? Not too, not too tall, not too short, right? So that, you know, the, what's known as sort of the Goldilocks range. His skin was not too dark, not too pale. His hair was not, uh, you know, it wasn't curly. It wasn't straight, but more wavy, right? His build wasn't, you know, he wasn't overweight. He wasn't too thin, but something in the middle. But he also had other qualities that are viewed probably cross-culturally as being beautiful uh, qualities in men. For example, long eyelashes. He had very broad shoulders, large forearms, large calves, right? He had an aquiline uh, nose, which is highly desirable across different, different cultures, okay? So, so there's, there's, there's this objective standard of physical beauty. So with respect to the Quran then, this intuitive sort of I feel it approach did not work for many Sunni uh, scholars, right? So people were definitely intuiting the Quran's beauty. There's no doubt about that. People were definitely intuiting the beauty, but scholars wanted to know why exactly that was happening, right? Just as if you, if you saw the Prophet وسلم, right, you would be overcome, overwhelmed by his beauty. And you can tell me why you were overcome. You specifically tell me why he was so, so beautiful. Okay. Now, um, now before we get to that, popular among Sunni mutakallimun, right? So like the scholastic or discursive theologians was what uh, could be called circumstantial evidence. Okay, so circumstantial evidence is evidence that relies on an inference or deduction to connect it to a fact or conclusion. In other words, indirect evidence like fingerprints at a crime scene, as opposed to like direct evidence, as opposed to like an eyewitness who saw an actual crime, right? So the Mutakallimun mentioned two pieces of circumstantial evidence. So number one, they say the Arabs had reached the peak of their language in seventh century Arabia, right? The Hejaz in the late antiquity was the height of Arabic. Poetry was their pride and joy. Right? They had the seven hanging odes, right? Al-Mu'allaqat al-Sab'u at the annual festival at a town called Urkav, just outside of Mecca. The Arab poets uh, would have taken the challenge of the Prophet وسلم, very, very, very seriously. They had ample motives for taking up the challenge with overwhelming enthusiasm. I mean, the Prophet وسلم, he was denouncing their gods. He was condemning aspects of their culture. He was claiming prophecy, right? However, they broke their, their, their custom of normal behavior. They broke their custom of normal behavior and persecuted and fought against the Prophet So this fact supports the notion that they immediately recognized the superiority of the Quran and simply knew that they couldn't answer the challenge. So this piece of circumstantial evidence supports the Sunni position of the Quran's internal incapacitating mechanism, okay? Or maybe they tried to imitate the Quran, right? You hear the Quran, you think this is beautiful, 
uh, and they thought to themselves, um, we can rival this. It's kind of like when, um, when you watch an expert calligrapher and he makes it look so easy and you think, well, I can do that. This looks easy, right? Then you try to do it and you, you're, it's not even close. So maybe they tried to imitate the Quran, but yet they failed consistently and collectively. So this kind of supports the Murtazili position of an external incapacitating uh, mechanism. In a verse that supports this position, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا تُتْلَ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُنَا قَالُوا قَدْ سَمِعْنَا لَوْ نَشَاءُ لَقُلْنَا مِثْلَ هَذَا when, when, when our signs are re rehearsed to them, they say, indeed, we have heard it, and if we wanted, we could say the like of that. We could say the likes of it as well, right? So Qadi Iyad, he mentions, he has a section uh, in, in, in his book on the, on the I'jaz, and he says that there was a poet named Yahya ibn Hakam al-Ghazal, who was uh, the foremost uh, of the poets in Andalusia. And he wanted to create something like Surah al-Ikhlas. So he began to work on it. And then he says, suddenly an incredible um, sense of terror came over me. It moved me to regret and repentance. Okay. So that's the first piece of circumstantial evidence is that is that the Arabs, it, it appears that the Arabs just, um, di, di, they immediately, uh, immediately began to persecute the Prophet Sallallahu rather than what would have been uh, expected of them to take the challenge of the Prophet Sallallahu very, very seriously and attempt to answer the challenge. And then eventually, of course, the greatest living Arab poets, all of them uh, became Muslim. All of them eventually confessed to the Quran superiority, whether it's Hassan ibn Thabit or Abdullah ibn Rawaha, Kaab ibn Zuhair, even the great uh, Labid ibn Rabi'a, all of them at some point threw their hands into the air and said that we cannot even come close to anything uh, like this. And then the second piece of indirect evidence is that the Quran has since not been successfully imitated. Okay. And and several modern Arab Christians have attempted to do this, and their attempts are their attempts have been laughingly pathetic. Um, so nothing even comes close. So then the two points, the two pieces then of indirect evidence, just to recap, are that the Arabs at the time could not produce its likeness, right? The greatest poets became Muslim, and the Arabs since that time have not produced its likeness. Now, many, Sun, many medieval Sunni theologians were not satisfied with this type of indirect evidence, primarily because the Mu'tazili could also argue these points to support uh, the sarfa, that the Quran has an, ex an external incapacitating uh, mechanism. So they sought direct evidence of the Quran's i'jaz, and they believed that this could be done from a literary standpoint. Okay, so the three major classical Sunni authorities who undertook this task were Qadi Abu Bakr al-Baqilani, right? His book is called I'jaz al-Quran. You have Abdul Qahir al-Jurjani, Dala'il al-I'jaz, or Asrar al-Baragha. And then you have Ibn Jazay al-Kalbi in his book At-Tashheel li-Ulum al-Tanzil. Okay, al-Baqilani, al-Jurjani, al-Kalbi. Now, according to these classical Sunni ulama, it is unique stylistics what are called asalib, unique stylistics and unmatched eloquence, balagha, which is at the seat of the Quran's i'jaz. So by unmatched eloquence, they mean that the Quran is objectively more eloquent than the poets. Okay, so like Musa alayhi salam, he confounded the sorcerers with his you know, white magic. It's, it was objectively superior, objectively more powerful. Isa alayhi salam confounded the physicians and healers of his day with his ability to heal people, his quote-unquote medicine. The Prophet ﷺ then confounded the poets, as shu'ara of his day with his style and eloquence. So with respect to eloquence, what makes a speaker more eloquent than others? So his superior choice of words and his clear and concise communication. Okay, this is what makes his words more powerful, more interesting, more motivating, um, more persuasive, 
and more memorable, i.e. more impactful. So eloquent speakers make an impact upon the heart and mind. Okay, so let's start with Al-Baqilani. So Al-Baqilani, he said that the style, the uslub of the Quran defies classification, right? It has unclassifiability, as he puts it. In other words, it broke the custom of the existing literary norms that were known to the Arabs at that time. So the kharq of the adat, right, the breach of, of, of what is customary, was not only external to the text with this initial sort of Arab reaction to the text to fight the Prophet but it was preeminently internal to the text, right? The Quran's unique, you know, abnormal, uncustomary style. And the Quran is an amazingly eloquent and, and masterful fusion, um, uh, fusion of, of, of poetry and prose, right? With, with incredible rhetoric as well, okay? Um, and and there's, there's actually no record of any poet at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu actually answering uh, the challenge. The Quran is an, an ocean of rhetoric. I mean, sometimes a college student will feel good if he uses one or two sort of rhetorical devices in a, in a research paper. The Quran is just, it's full of hundreds and hundreds of rhetorical devices, an ocean of rhetoric. So its miracle was the creation of a new unidentifiable and inimitable genre of expression. Okay, the Quran style is sui generis, right? Which means it's in a class of its own, totally outside human forms of literature. Okay, so it may include familiar rhetorical elements like isti'ara and mubalagha, like metaphor and hyperbole and like simile, uh, but only to assimilate them into this unclassifiable otherness. Al-Baqilani compares the ayat of the Qur'an, he compares them to the abyad of the ash'ar, the, the, the verses of the greatest of the Arab poets, and he points out that the Qur'an has no weak verses, no verse in the Qur'an can be improved rhetorically, whereas all poems have a weak verse here and there, right? For example, like to be or not to be, that is the question. That's from Shakespeare's Hamlet, no improvement is possible there. Right? But there are some verses that can be improved. So Baqilani says that all Jahali, all Jahali po uh, poets, some of their lines uh, can be improved, whereas nothing of the Quran can, can be improved. So, so the Arabs could not find a literary form to which the Quran corresponded. They were just sort of scratching their heads. Right? And this is evident in the Quran itself. Right? They say, is this, is this shi'r? Is this, is this poetry? Right? Uh, is this sihr? Is this magic? Is this kihana? Is this a type of like fortune telling or, or soothsaying? Because the diviners, right, the fortune tellers, the kuhan, uh, they, would, they would speak their sort of predictions in something called saja, which is rhymed, uh, rhymed prose. And the Quran uh, is, is not exactly saja. It's, it's transcends it. It's, it's different. It's unique. They would say, are these sort of fictional tales of the ancients, Asatir al Awwalin, right? They couldn't identify the Quran's literary form, okay? Um, so that's Al Baqilani. Now, Al Jurjani, he seeks to map out a definitive paradigm for understanding the Quran's inimitable eloquence. So he downplays intuition and subjective responses. He also downplays circumstantial evidence. Uh, as a testimony to the Quran's inimitability, and he sets out to establish the case on purely literary grounds. Okay, um, so he argues that the Arabs they were initially dazzled and struck into wonderment by the Quran. Jurjani uses the Arabs' initial reaction as a proof against the sarfa. Right, their their reaction wasn't that's nice, but we can do that. No, it was a state of utter bewilderment. Right? Ibn Hisham relates the story of Al-Walid ibn Mughira, arguably the greatest living poet at the time, that he was absolutely awestruck by the qira'ah of the Prophet ﷺ. And he went back to his people and he said, this conquers and destroys everything that came before it of poetry. And then he said to the people as well, to the Quraysh, he said, this is not his regular speech. This is something else. And then you know, peer pressure got to him and eventually caved in. And his story is told uh, in the Quran. 
for Durjani, the Quran's um, style, composition, arrangement of words and eloquence is beyond human capacity. And like Baqilani, he, he demonstrates this by comparing various poems written by the greatest of the Arab poets with the, with the ayat of the Quran and concludes that the latter are objectively superior. Okay. And then finally, Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi, he said that the Quran's i'jaz has 10 elements. Number one, its eloquence is above any human speech. You can say here that it's impact, right? It's impact for better or worse, right? Like the Quran says, uh, that when you, when you mention your Lord in the Quran, the oneness of your Lord in the Quran, they turn, they turn back in aversion. And this is a question, it's an interesting question that sometimes we get is if the Quran is, if the Quran is so eloquent, then why didn't all of the Arabs believe in it as a divine revelation? Why didn't Abu Jahal, for example, believe it was a divine revelation? Well, first and foremost, the Quran is calling to a moral life. It's calling towards a certain type of life, right? A certain type of ethic, okay? So if, if people don't want to change their lives, it doesn't matter how beautiful or how eloquent the message is, um, they're not going to believe in it. They're not going to, uh, to follow it, okay? The very sound of the qira'a raptures non-Arabs uh, and non-Muslims as well. Qadi the Iyad relates in his book that um, it's reported that Christians heard the Quran and began to weep. Uh, Suyuti so said that several people, several people died when they heard the Qara'a of the Quran. I'll tell you this from experience, my college roommate who was a Catholic, he, I played the Quran for him in the car, recitation by Sa'ad al-Ghamidi of Surat Yusuf, and he just kind of sat there and he was, he had this strange look on us. I mean, he was literally awestruck by it. And he told me later that he just, he was thinking about it. And uh, he en eventually ended up uh, making his shahada a few days later. And he said one of the, one of the, um, uh, the key moments, uh, the pivotal moments that led him to that decision was, was just hearing the Quran. There are actually dozens and dozens of Quran reaction videos on YouTube, by the way. Some of these have millions of views. Okay, Christians, atheists, agnostics, listening to the Quran, you see people's jaws drop. They start weeping profusely. Uh, you know, this guy, he let his little baby listen to the Quran, his baby stopped crying, you know. Um, I asked one of my teachers about this, and he said, this is because their tongues are ajami, but their hearts are arabi, right? And the heart, the soul understands what the mind can't, right? It's, and it speaks to the fitzra. This is the word of God. It speaks to the human being. So, so definitely, you know, these people are intuiting something about the Quran. And that's, and that's uh, very, very apparent. So that's number one. It's eloquence is above human speech. And then he says the unique arrangement of the ayat and the suwar, right? like the structure of the Quran at the micro and macro levels. So if you look at something, for example, one ayah, ayatul kursi, if you look at this ayah and break it down, it's a chiasmus. It, it has sort of a concentric composition. But this is also true if you look at, for example, a larger suwar. You look at al-Baqarah. There's a book written by... I believe Raymond Farron on Surah Al-Baqarah, he says the entire surah is, is, has, has a symmetry to the entire surah, 286 verses. Michelle Kuyper is another, these are non-Muslim uh, scholars of the Quran, you can call them Orientalists if you want, but phenomenal work they're doing. He did a book on Surah Al-Ma'idah, Michelle Kuyper's, where he, where he looks at the um, incredible composition and, and, uh, and symmetry of Surah Al-Ma'idah. And of course, in our tradition as well, you have people like Islahi, and al-farahi, coherence in the Quran, looking at the coherence, looking at the composition. I mean, this is just sort of something that is getting off the ground nowadays. I mean, there's going to be a lot of literature coming out of the academy, at least there should be on this topic. So the unique arrangement of the ayat and the surah, of course, Fakhruddin al-Razi writes about this as well. Number three, he says, uh, al-Kalbi says, Juzay ibn Juzay al-Kalbi, the incapacitation of the Arabs to produce something similar at that time as well as thereafter. Number four, the stories of the Quran, which could not have been known to the Prophet Sallallahu We say maybe he knew about the Exodus and the, like the flood and the deluge, but there are things in the Quran that could not have been known. It's specialized knowledge, like from Talmudic tradition, 
right? Th these are things that are known through initiatic chains of transmission, passed down from like rabbi to student, rabbi to student. How does he know those things? Number five, the predictions of the Quran that came true, like the defeat of the Persians within a few years. Number six, the perfect theological orthodoxy espoused by the Quran, the tawhid of Allah restored and refined, right? Or as Imam al-Razi says, the sirat al-mustaqim, which is between tashbih of the Christians and the ta'til of the Jews, right? The confirmation of the wahdaniyah and ahadiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rejection of tahleef, rejection of the trinity, right? The perfect theological orthodoxy. Number seven, the superior ahkam and akhlaq, the laws and morals espoused by the Quran, its prescribed orthopraxis, as well as its what's known as trajectory hermeneutics with respect to its laws, that the Quran clearly is moving toward the abolition of slavery. I mean, that's, it's very, very clear, I think, if you, if you engage with the Quran and you engage with the Sunnah. I mean, Islam initially abolished all forms of slavery except through war. I mean, people in the Jahali time, if someone owed you money, you can make them, their, their, you can make them your slave. You can just go and raid a, a town unprovoked, not as, not, not as a, um, a defense sort of maneuver, not as a, um, as a um, what's known as a, uh, a uh, preeminent strike, uh, um, but, uh, but just, just going and raiding a town and taking people as slaves. So all of these were abolished in Islam except, except through war. It's called riq, it's not called ubudiyah, right? It's more of a type of indentured servitude. And the purpose was to, re in, to reintegrate really people into the society at large. But one can make a strong argument that the Quran is moving towards the, ab the total abolition of slavery. That's called trajectory uh, hermeneutics. Preemptive strike, that's what I was trying to say earlier. Number uh, eight, the divinely or providentially preserved text of the Quran, right? That, that there are 10 qira'at of the Quran. All of them are multiply attested. You know, you find these you know, videos made by Christians and this version of the Quran, the, the Duri qira'a is different than the Hafs. And, you know, it's the, so they conclude that the Quran has not been preserved. They don't know the basis. They don't know the foundations of ulum al-Quran, that there are 10 qira'at of the Quran. All of them are multiply attested. All of them. Have, have chains of transmission that go back to the Prophet ﷺ, and these are the same all around the world for 14 centuries. Number nine, the ease by which the Qur'an is memorized. This is incredible. You have 10-year-old hafad of the Qur'an, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنِ The Qur'an says we have made this Qur'an easy to memorize. And then of course, number 10, and finally, the, the incredible polyvalence of the text of the Qur'an, that it is multi-layered in its meaning as well as the fact that the, that the reader never tires of reading the text year after year, decade after decade. So these are just some of the things I wanted to mention about the incredible uniqueness of our scripture, of the Quran. And, you know, we should be engaged with the Quran on a daily basis. Um, this is something that is commanded in the Quran. Afalayatadabbaruna al Quran, tadabbur of the Quran means to really penetrate the meanings of the Quran. But not just the meanings, not just you know, memorizing, but engaging at a deep level, uh, um, uh, studying the Quran, its relevance in the world today, understanding that there's two types of discourse in the Quran. There's two types of khitab. There's a khitab of taklif and a khitab of of wada, there's a situational discourse of the Quran that may affect some of its ahkam depending on circumstances. So this is a very deep study that we need to engage in um, that uh, is now becoming necessary for more and more people because the Quran is constantly under attack. So I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts our fasting uh, in, our, in our prayers. I accept that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts everything we do uh, for his sake and to purify our intentions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. Uh, have a good Eid uh, and we'll see you soon inshallah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.